So I would like to tell a story um, as to how I was able to justify breaking bones for um, most of my PhD and, and as a research topic. Um, so to start off, we can think about uh, a pretty well-known and uh, common problem, um, the total hip replacement. So if you uh, have a healthy hip, like shown here on the left, um, in the pre-COVID era, you're able to run around, play with your kids um, when things are really right, nice. Um, but on the right side here, what I'm showing is a arthritis of the hip, uh, which is a condition plagued by sort of degradation of cartilage and bone spurs, uh, which effectively really limits uh, people's mobilities. And, and one of the ways that we've been sort of trying to solve this since uh, the 1950s is this uh, total, total hip replacement, um, which effectively employs the use of usually titanium alloys and sort of polymeric um, cup cone geometries uh, to just replace uh, basically your bone. Um, but the problem with this approach uh, is manifested in many ways. One is your native bone tends to fracture, that joint effectively dislocates multiple times, uh, and then the implant will, you know, doesn't really match well with the native bone and you'll get a lot of loosening. Um, and this results in, you know, revision surgeries and then the same problems can occur uh, again and again. Um, now the truth is we actually have many uh, biocompatibility problems when it comes to mechanics uh, from some more recent examples like Neuralink's um, neural implants, which is limited, the depth at which they can probe into the brain is limited by the mechanical properties of uh, the actual probes to surgical sutures that we use uh, to this common um, bone implant problem that I just described. Uh, so wh why is this? Um, okay, so we can think about this in terms of biogenic materials, so materials that are naturally made, uh, sort of cell-made materials, and uh, synthetic materials. So biogenic materials uh, are collectively light, strong, tough, and tunable. And what I mean by that uh, is that uh, we can look at it in this sort of materials property space where we look at toughness, which is the material's um, ability to resist crack growth, and then strength, which is its ability to resist uh, permanent deformation. And this upper right corner here is sort of, you know, this very desirable region to be occupied. But when you populate this plot with our engineering materials like composites and metals and whatnot, you see that they're not really able to sort of occupy the space in the same way that biogenic materials can. Right. So the questions that I'm really interested uh, in probing are how do biogenic materials achieve this combination of strength and toughness that allow them to take up the space? And then by understanding that, can we leverage that uh, in developing better synthetic materials for implants, for example? Um, so one of the ways that I like to think about this um, is to ask the question, OK, so you know, what happens when my lab mate, uh, Carlos here, who was gen uh, kind enough to provide his x-ray, what happened when he uh, broke, his, um, broke his arm? Well, when a crack travels through your bone, there's various things that happen to sort of make it harder and harder to, to propagate. One of them is a crack interacts with these 200 micron uh, osteons and it deflects and it makes it difficult to keep going. At smaller length scales, uh, you get this sort of uncracked ligaments uh, that will open up in front of the crack and again, prevent it from wanting to keep going. Um, and another thing that will occur is this, you know, uh, diffuse damage um, at smaller length scales. So the length scale where you tend to have sort of a laminated structure um, in your bone. Now, this is, you know, from a macro to sort of micro picture, uh, qualitative picture of how we understand bone fracture. Uh, we can sort of map this onto a quantitative picture so what I'm showing here is, again, that um, energy dissipation um, as a crack is growing as a function of crack extension. So basically, what we're seeing here is that as a crack is growing through your bone, uh, it takes more and more energy uh, to get it to continue to propagate. 
Um, so let me provide some context for this. Uh, if we look at another sort of biogenic material of interest, so this is abalone shell. Um, it's sort of a brick and mortar type structure that also exhibits this sort of toughening behavior, right? But it's sort of a less complex uh, architecture than what I just showed you in the bone. And to provide some even more context, we can look at uh, something known as a metallic glass, which is basically an amorphous metal that, you know, most people would say has no structure, no hierarchy at all. So what we're showing is a quantitative way of looking at um, toughness or energy dissipation in relation to crack growth in materials that exhibit different levels of system hierarchy with bone showing this uniquely high toughening behavior with a unique um, set of uh, hierarchical length scales, right? So this is the quantitative picture of like the state of the art. So if we go back um, with bone having such a complicated structure, the question remains is what happens at these smaller length scales, right? When we have mineralized collagen fibrils that are on the order of 150 nanometers. Um, one of the things that's been hypothesized is that these mineralized collagen fibrils tend to hold uh, cracks together and prevent them from propagating. And then at even smaller length scales, you know, there's this idea that collagen will slide past each other or collagen molecules will begin to uncoil. And all of these are things that contribute to energy dissipation. So what's really important is being able to go down to these length scales, um, quantify, isolate uh, the mechanisms that would be happening down there. So the way we approach this is effectively like this. So on the left, what I'm showing is the schematic of a bone. We're looking uh, into the condyle, so effectively your knee. And if you look into your knee, you have this really pretty architecture, a trabecular architecture of beams and plates. And then you go into one of these beams or plates, and then you have this lamin laminated structure um, that are near to five microns or so. And what we're able to do is go in and pick out one of these specific uh, laminated structures and pr produce a beam that is uh, very well-defined geometry on your on order of a few microns. Um, and then we can do that with the sort of site-specific uh, precision and orientation that we can even go in and look at uh, transmission electron microscope uh, images of the fibril orientation, the collagen fibril orientation. And what I'm showing here on the right is effectively just that technique in GIF form, schematic form on top, where we've done it on other materials. And then uh, this is uh, a GIF of, of it happening live in the uh, SEM. Okay, so now uh, hopefully Zoom fatigue hasn't settled in yet. Um, and I can show you some uh, videos of bone breaking. So this is one of those beams. And the first experiment I'd like to show you is effectively we introduce a flaw or a defect uh, in this beam, and what I want you to do is focus on this area here, uh, where I, I'm going to apply a load with this piece of diamond onto this bone, which sounds very drastic, but it's a way of doing this really well-controlled experiment. What you'll see is a crack sort of propagating from this artificially introduced defect, going up, up, and then you know you get this catastrophic failure of the bone. Um, and we can quantify what occurred by looking at the sort of fracture toughness value, um, which shouldn't mean too much to you right now, right? Um, so what I'm going to do next is show you a different experiment where, okay, so we have the artificially introduced flaw, but then what we've also done is we've fatigued the sample in order to create a more realistic flaw. So beyond this, there's a tiny crack that's not yet visible. And that's effectively to simulate, again, what I said earlier about running around and playing with the kids, um, you know, basically the fatigue that occurs from just walking around campus. So at this point, I, I encourage you to hypothesize as to what's going to happen relative to the other sample, but I'm going to play it and overlay the data. And what you're seeing is that flaw opening up and then the crack propagating and then the bone catastrophically failing. And then we can also quantify it again. And what we're seeing, which is actually not expected, is that this uh, realistic crack, this realistically sharp flaw, is tougher than the artificial one that we introduced. Um, so why is that? 
So if we recall to our original hypothesis, um, the original question that we're probing is what is happening at these tiny length scales? And I'm going to, I swear this is the last video of bone breaking. Um, you can actually see that there are collagen furballs that are acting in, actively acting in this crack and holding this piece of bone together. And if you go in and you look at the images right after you've broken the bone, you can see, like I said, 50 nanometer or so uh, fibers um, and then complementary surface where they've pulled out and left holes. Um, okay, so we've identified the mechanism. Let's go back big picture again. Uh, so recall we're describing sort of energy dissipation in hierarchical systems as a function of crack growth. So there's a lot here, but we're focusing on the bone system itself, right? And what we've done is said, okay, bone has all of these smaller length scales that we do not understand. When we put in our data, we're able to show that what we knew about bone before does not extend down to these critical uh, sub-micron length scales. When you're actually able to go in and probe and isolate what happens at these small length scales, you actually see a very different way in which it toughens. In other words, as you reduce the hierarchy, uh, you change the way the toughening behavior occurs. Um, okay, so what does this all mean? So I'd like to zoom out again, bigger picture. Uh, the foundation of what I was really able to show you is that we can go in and do some very sort of small scale site specific uh, tissue mechanical experiments. Um, so this is sort of the type of work I would like to continue to do. And I think that's very heavily complemented by um, the results I showed in the last slide, which is basically producing these constitutive models of tissues um, and, and providing some simulation results for that. Uh, and then finally, which is something that I don't have time to really talk about, but I'm really focusing on in my postdoc, is basically synthesis uh, via metal additive manufacturing and, and nanoparticle synthesis uh, of some really interesting materials. Um, and this is sort of the vision I would like my lab uh, to establish. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my group at Caltech, uh, this metal additive manufacturing group, at Stanford and, and Wendy Gu's uh, lab here. Uh, thank you.